Hi everyone, a very good afternoon to all of you. I'm from the JSG 204 team of TrueChip Solutions and welcome you all to this webinar. Today, we are going to present a webinar on understanding JSG 204C. At the end of this webinar, we will have a question answer round in which you can ask your questions in the option which is present at the bottom of your screen. So these are the topics which we are going to discuss in this webinar. First, we will go through the introduction to JSG 204C. Then we will discuss about the differences between 204C and the previous version, which was JSG 204B. After that, we will explain the device classification and subclassification. Then we will list and cover functionality of each layer in JSG 204C. At last, we will be discussing about clocking and deterministic latency. So before we proceed, let us discuss the requirement of JSG 204 specification. JSG 204C is a serialized interface between data converters and logic devices. As we know that chip size is reducing, it is challenging to pack multiple converters in a single package due to more number of pin counts. Traditional approaches like integrating converters with signal processing logic or multi-chip modules can overcome this problem. But they also have some drawbacks like decrease in the converter performance. If converter function and digital VLSI are integrated, it puts performance limits on mixed signal design and increase the digital switching noise into sensitive analog circuit parts and adds some cost also. Now, there are some standard serialized differential links which provide solutions in this case. However, they suit better to processors while for other applications where simple continuous data stream is required, such PC centric interfaces impose some additional complexity and overhead. For such appliances, a specification is required, which enables front end data acquisition systems to take advantage of high speed serial links with minimal overhead. The JSG 204 specification addresses this need. There can be a single converter or multiple converters which can be connected to a single logic device. Data converters include analog to digital converters or ADC as well as digital to analog converters or DAC. A logic device can include an FPGA, ASIC, etc. When an ADC is used, it has to be connected at the TX side with RX working as a logic device. And if a DAC is used, it has to be connected at the RX side with TX working as a logic device. JSC 204C has a layered architecture. That is, the whole specification is divided into various layers, with each layer having its own functionality. Also, the JSC 204C supports either of the three different data link layers, which are as follows. The 64-bit, 66-bit link layer, the 64-bit, 80-bit link layer, and the 8-bit, 10-bit link layer. So moving on to the next slide, this slide shows the block diagrams for JESC 204C having ADC devices connected to a logic device with the help of lanes. A combination of these lanes is referred to as a link. Each device is connected to an external device clock. Device clocks connected to different converter devices, that is ADC devices, have to be same and may or may not be the same to the device clock that is connected to the logic device. As you can see, a sync signal is also present, whose direction is from the receiver to the transmitter. The usage of this particular signal we will discuss later on. A similar case is also shown with DHC devices at the receiver side 
connected to a transmitter logic device. So moving on to the next slide, here we are going to talk about the four layers of JESG 204C. These are the application layer, which may consist of converters such as ADC or DAC. The transport layer, which is responsible for converting user samples provided by the application layer into frame data or vice versa. The data link layer, which is responsible for controlling the timing and synchronization between transmitter and receiver. And the last one is the physical layer. Now this layer converts the final data into bit stream and drives the data bits onto the link. So here is a block diagram for better, better understanding of layers on both the sides of the link. Now moving on to the next slide. So here we are going to discuss about the differences between transmitter, transmitter block and transmitter devices. And similarly at the receiver side, that is receiver, receiver block and receiver device. So at first, let us understand what a transmitter and a receiver is with the help of block diagrams. A transmitter or receiver consists of a physical layer and a data link layer. Each one of them is connected to a lane. Now, a transmitter or receiver block consists of one or more transmitter or receivers along with the transport layer. Each transmitter or receiver block is connected to a link. A converter device consists of one or more transmitter or receiver blocks along with their respective converters as shown in the figure. So now moving on to the next slide, we will discuss now the differences between JSG 204C and the previous version, which is JSG 204B. The maximum data rate supported by 204B is 12.5 Gbps, whereas 204C supports a higher data rate of 32 Gbps. 204B supports only 8-bit NB encoding, whereas 204C supports two more types of encoding along with the 8-bit NB, which are 64-bit to 66-bit and 64-bit to 80-bit encoding, about which we will discuss later on in detail. In 204P, timings of the sync signal, about which we will discuss later on, are relative to the frame clock, whereas in 204C, the frame clock is replaced by sync generation and sync detection clock. And all the timings of sync signal are relative to these clocks. 204B supports only hardwired sync interface, whereas 204C supports both hardwired as well as soft sync interface. The next difference is that in 204B, the maximum value of K, that is the number of frames present in a multi-frame is limited to 32. Whereas in 204C, maximum value of K is 256. And the next difference is that in 204B, the deterministic latency is calculated in terms of number of frame cycles. Whereas in 204C, it is calculated in terms of number of adjustment steps, which can have an implementation dependent size. So moving on to the next slide. Now we are going to discuss about various classes and subclasses defined in JESG 204C. JESG 204C defines two categories of classes which are category B and category C. Category B contains three classes, which are B3, B6 and B12, each having a different maximum data rate. And category C also contains three classes, which with each one of them having a maximum data rate of 32 Gbps. Now, in addition to above device classes, Three subclasses are also defined based on their ability to support deterministic latency. I will explain about the deterministic latency in the upcoming slides. So as of now, 
we can consider deterministic latency only as a distribution factor for all the three subclasses. The subclasses are as follows. The first one is subclass zero, having no support for deterministic latency. The next subclass is subclass one, where deterministic latency is achieved using an external sysref signal. As of now, it is important to note that in subclass one, the sysref plays an important role in clock realignment. The next subclass is subclass two, where deterministic latency is achieved using the sync signal. So moving on to the next slide, here we are going to discuss about the transport layer in detail. As we have discussed previously, that inside a transmitter, transport layer is responsible for conversion of data samples into frame octet data. Similarly, at the receiving end, it is responsible for conversion of frame octet data back into data samples. The next important feature of transport layer is lane mapping. That is, in case of multiple lane configuration, the transport layer at the TX side divides the complete frame octet data among individual lanes. And at the RX side, it does just the opposite. That is, it collects individual data from all the lanes and forms a complete frame, which is later on converted back into data samples. Also, the transport layer supports TL test pattern, where actual data samples that were to be transmitted over the link are replaced by predetermined test samples. Also, if data samples contain one or more control bits, then these control bits are also replaced by the test control bits. Now, I'm going to list some of the parameters that are used in the transport layer. These are as shown. So moving on to the next slide. Now, here we are going to discuss about the whole process for conversion of data samples into frame octet data and mapping them into lanes. At first, we have a converter device having M number of converters with each converter having a resolution of N bits. Also, S number of samples is being taken from each converter in every frame. So that means there are M number of converters from zero to M minus one. From each converter, S number of samples are taken into account for each frame. That is from sample zero to S minus one. Now, CS number of control bits are, um, are either appended after each sample to form a word with N plus CS number of bits or they are grouped into a separate control word. If each word formed in the previous step does not contain total number of bits in multiple of four, then it is extended into the next smallest neighbor group by appending tail bits. Now, after this step, if the total number of bits for each name is not a multiple of eight, then again, tail bits are appended as you can see in the diagram. Now, the total number of bits obtained after the last step is regrouped into F number of octets. These F octets are transmitted by the transport layer on each lane. So this is the complete process of converting data samples into frame data. So moving on to the next slide, the next feature of transport layer is TL test pattern where we have already discussed that the user samples and control bits are replaced by predetermined test samples and test control bits. This, pat this pattern is repetitive in nature and based on its periodicity, it is further divided into two types. That are short TL test pattern with a periodicity of one frame and a long TL test pattern with a periodicity of multiple frames. So moving on to the next slide. Now we are going 
to discuss about the data link layer in detail. Based on the encoding scheme used, 204C supports either of the three different data link layers. These are 64-bit, 66-bit link layer, 64-bit, 80-bit link layer, and 8-bit NB link layer. Also, it is important to note that the selection of data link layers can be done if the data rate is known. Based on the data rate, the link layers can be either required, recommended, optional, or not recommended, as shown. For data rate up to 12.5 GBPS, 8 bit NB is a required link layer. Whereas for data rate from 12.5 GBPS to 32 GBPS, 64 bit to 66 bit is the required link layer. And 64 bit to 80 bit can be used optionally. In the upcoming slides, we will discuss about each of the three data link layers in detail. So moving on to the next slide, now let us start with a 64 bit to 66 bit and 64 bit to 80 bit link layer. So at the beginning, let us understand a few definitions that are used in these layers. A block is a structure with two bits of sync headers plus 64 bits of data plus fill bits in case of 64 bit to 80 bit encoding. A multi block is a collection of 32 blocks. And an extended multi block is a collection of e multi blocks. Also, an extended multi block should contain an integer number of frames. So, moving on to the next slide. So, here we are going to discuss about the transmit process for the above mentioned link layers. At a time, eight octets from the transport layer are scrambled and CRC or FEC parity bits are calculated. We will discuss about the CRC and FEC in the upcoming slides. The sync headers and the fill bits for the case of 64 bit to 80 bit link layer are then added to the scrambled data and sent to the physical layer. The fill bits can be calculated using the 17 bit PRBS se uh, sequence as shown. So moving on to the next slide, here we will talk about the receiver operation. The receiver first determines the sync header boundaries and ignores the fill bits. After this, it will perform FEC or CRC checks and then it descrambles the data. After that, it will send the data to the transport layer. So moving on to the next slide, Scrambling is a mandatory feature of 64-bit to 66-bit and 64-bit to 80-bit link layer. The scrambler polynomial and the corresponding LFSR are as shown. So moving on to the next slide, sync transition bits are present inside the sync header in, in the starting of the block. And these are used for the purpose of synchronization and some features like CRC, FEC, or commands. The table shows how sync transition bits are encoded into sync headers. At the receiver side, the received sync headers are then decoded back into the sync transition bits as shown. Now let us understand what a sync word is and how it is formed. A sync word provides information parallel to the user data. A sync word is formed from 32 sync transition bits. A sync word consists of a pilot signal plus any one of the following information. CRC12 signal and CRC3 signal, both of them are for error detection. And an FEC signal is for error detection as well as for correction. And also there is a command channel. The purpose of pilot signal is to allow the receiver to find the boundaries of multi block and the extended multi block. Pilot signal uses some fixed identifiers such as ones, zeros, and end of extended multi block, about which we will discuss in the upcoming slides. C 
CRC12 encoding is used for error detection when a higher precision is required. It is having a high latency of at least 46 blocks. Input is of one multi-block, that is 2048 bits are shifted serially in the LFSR. After all the bits are shifted in, 12 parity bits are obtained. The sync word mapping with CRC12 signal is as shown. Here, bits 27 to 31 contains 5 bit end of multi block sequence. Also, the 22nd bit contains the end of EMP identifier, which, if set to 1, indicates that the current multi block is the end of extended multi block. This pattern of pilot signal is same for CRC3, FEC, and for standalone command channel. The CRC3 encoding is used when error detection with a lower latency is required. It is having a latency lower than that of CRC12. A total of 512 bits are shifted serially into the LFSR, which is shown along with the generating polynomial. The sync word mapping with CRC3 signal is as shown. FEC encoding is very important at the RX side for detection and correction of errors. Input is of one multi-block or 2048 bits. The generating polynomial is as shown along with the LFSR. The transmitter calculates FEC parity bits of 2048 scrambled data bits of a multi-block and encodes these parity bits on the sync header stream of the next multi-block as shown. The receiver on the other hand creates a cyclic code word by appending the FEC bits transmitted in the current multi-block to the data that was transmitted in the previous multi-block. At the receiver side, 26 bit syndrome is calculated using the fire decoder as shown in the figures. If the value of the syndrome is not equal to zero, then that means an error has occurred during the data transmission. If the value of S25, which is the MSB of syndrome, is equal to 1, and S16 to S0 bits of the syndrome are all zeros, then that means the error is trapped and the corrected data is Rx, that is received code word XORing with SX, that is the syndrome. So moving on to the next slide. If the error is not trapped, then the received code word Rx is rotated one bit to the right to obtain R1x and the syndrome for R1x, which is S1x, is calculated. The above steps are repeated until the error gets trapped. If before, the, the received code word is rotated t, uh, t times before the error is trapped, then the corrected code word is RTX XORing with STX. So moving on to the next slide, the sync word mapping with FEC signal is as shown. So now we are going to discuss about the command channel. The command channel is used for sending commands. That is the header, the header and the data, or we can say the payload to the receiver over the sync headers instead of using the actual data channel. Command channel cannot exist when FEC signal is transmitted in the sync word. A command word can either be a header command word or a payload command word. Also, a header command word may or may not be followed by the payload command word. A command word consists of six command bits. The MSB or the sixth command bit indicates whether the command word contains a header or payload. Command bits 1 to 5 consist of header or payload data. The LSB or the 0th bit indicates the parity. A header command word can be followed by a maximum of 35 payload bits. 
so now moving on to the next slide here we are going to discuss about the two types of command channels the first one is crc utilized command channel where only one command word is sent along with the crc parity bits inside a sync word an example for the same has been shown the other one is a standalone command channel where three command words are sent in a sync word an example for the same has also been shown each type of command channel can have either of the two operating modes which are single lane utilized or all lanes utilized an example for both of the CR, for both of them for crc utilized command channel has been shown where there are two lanes and in the first case both of them have been utilized to transmit the command word whereas in the second case only one lane is utilized so here is another example for both the operating modes in standalone command channel so moving on to the next slide the sync word mapping with standalone command channel is as shown so in the next two slides we are going to discuss about the receiver operation specific to 64 bit 66 bit and 64 bit to 80 bit link layer firstly we are going to discuss about the sync header alignment initially at reset the state machine is at sh init state the receiver counts the bits from 0 to block width minus 1 that is from 0 to 65 or 0 to 79 depending on the encoding scheme encoding scheme which is used initially the counter is reset as soon as it gets a transition which is a sync header transition it starts incrementing its counter after receiving first transition state machine moves to sh hunt state here the rx wait for sync header transition after each block any invalid transition results in the state machine to move to sh init state after detecting four continuous valid transitions sync header alignment is achieved and state machine moves to sh lock state here receiver asserts sh lock to 1 this sh lock condition is necessary to start the extended multi block alignment state machine here in ss lock state the receiver continues to trade, uh, to uh, detect the transitions and count the number of invalid transitions if received if number of invalid sync header transitions detected equals to the threshold then it is assumed that the sync header alignment is lost and the machine moves to sh init state this threshold can be fixed to 16 or it can be programmable moving on to the next slide here we are going to discuss about the emb alignment initially the emb alignment uh, state machine is at the emb init state and waits for the sync header alignment to be done that is for ss lock to be one after ss lock is done receiver counts sync transition bits from 0 to 31 as the sync word is of 32 bits and waits for the end of multi block sequence that is 5 bit pilot signal which is 4 times 0 and a 1 and end of extended multi block identifier upon receiving correct pilot signals state machine moves to emp hunt state here the receiver continues to de uh, to uh, detect valid end of extended multi block sequences any invalid sequence received result in the state machine to move to emb init state after detection of four continuous valid end of multi block sequences emb alignment is achieved and the state machine moves to emb lock state at the emb lock state the receiver asserts emb lock equals to 1 in emb lock state the receiver continues to uh, to uh, detect the pilot signals and counts the number of invalid sequences if received if number of invalid sequence received is equal to threshold then it is assumed that the emb alignment is lost and the state machine moves to init state 
this threshold can be fixed to 8 or it can be programmable so this was all about the sync header alignment and the extended multi-block alignment so any questions till now please feel free to ask we will answer them at the end of this webinar moving on to the next slide now we will start with the 8 bit nb link layer these are some of the features of the 8 bit nb link layer note that except scrambling and descrambling remaining features are not a part of other two link layers now i'm going to discuss about each one of them in detail Starting with the 8-bit NB encoding, here are some of its properties. The first one is that it has sufficient bit transition density, which means in each 10-bit code, there are 3 to 10 transitions, which will be very helpful in the clock recovery process at the receiver side. The next is DC balance, that is equal number of ones and zeros are present. Also, this encoding scheme is useful for detecting single bit errors. And at last, the 8-bit NB encoding also provides control characters apart from the data characters, which are useful for the receiver synchronization or to mark the start of the frames, multi-frames, etc. As, we, as uh, you can see later on. An example is also shown where K28.5, also denoted by K, is a control character and T2.4 is a data character. Each one of them has two possible 10 bit values based on the current running disparity. So, moving on to the next slide, here we are going to discuss in more detail about the sync interface. The sync interface is the only feedback path from the receiver to the transmitter. It consists of an active low sync signal. The assertion and deassertion of this sync signal at the receiver are relative to the sync generation clockage. The detection of the sync signal at the transmitter is done relative to the sync detection clockage. Also, 204C supports hardwired and soft sync interface, about which we have already discussed. The sync interface can be used as an indication for initialization, reinitialization, or for error reporting. To start a synchronization request, the sync is asserted for at least 49 character duration. Whereas for error reporting, this duration reduces to exactly 16 characters. In addition, JSG 204C also supports sync combination for multipoint links. Unlike other two link layers, scrambling is an optional feature of 8-bit NB link layer. The scrambler polynomial and the corresponding LFSR are as shown. So moving on to the next slide, here we are going to discuss about the transmitter and receiver operations in the 8-bit NB link layer. Initially, sync request is asserted by the receiver at the sync generation clockage, the transmitter then samples the sync signal on sync detection clockage. Upon reception of the sync signal for at least four detection clock periods, the transmitter interprets the sync as a synchronization request. The transmitter then drives K characters for the receiver to perform clock recovery and also for the code group synchronization, which we will discuss in the upcoming slides. After synchronization request, the logic device, whether it is a transmitter or a receiver, issues a generate system request to the clock generator. In response, a system is provided to all the link to all the devices. This system, as we will discuss later, will be used to align the clocks at both the transmitter and receiver sides. The receiver then deasserts the sync at a programmable LMFC edge. Now, after sync deassertion detection, 
transmitter transmit ILAs on all the links. We will discuss in more detail about the ILAs in the upcoming slides. After completion of ILAs, user, uh, user data is transmitted on all the links. So moving on to the next slide here, we are going to discuss about the sync signal combining. When a receiver belonging to a particular lane issues a synchronization request, the sync signal is combined for all the lanes. That is, sync combination is mandatory for all the lanes in a link. Whereas for a multipoint link, the sync, uh, the sync signal may or may not be combined. Also, the sync combination for a multipoint link is always done inside a logic device. So here the diagram represents the configuration of two ADC devices connected to a receiver logic device. If any receiver asserts synchronization request, then it will be combined inside the receiver logic device and distributed to each ADC device. Similarly is the case for two DAC devices connected to a transmitter logic device where sync signal from each DAC device is combined inside the transmitter logic device. So this was all about the sync combination. Now moving on to the next slide. So here we are going to discuss about the initial link establishment of JEC 204C 8B10B link layer. This includes code group synchronization, initial frame synchronization and initial lane synchronization. The code group synchronization is done in order to synchronize the 10 bit code group boundary of both transmitter and receiver. The initial frame synchronization is done in order to synchronize the frame boundary of both the sides. Similarly, the initial link synchronization is done to align the multi frame boundary of both the sides. This is achieved by means of an initial lane alignment sequence as shown in the figure. So ILAs consist of four multi frames each starting with R character and ending with an A character. The second multi frame of the ILS consists an additional Q character, indicating that this multi frame consists of configuration parameters. So moving on to the next slide, we will now discuss about the character replacement inside the transmitter device. Character replacement depends on whether the scrambling is enabled or whether it is disabled in the data link layer. At first, let us consider the case where scrambling is disabled. Here, if the last octet in the current frame but not coinciding with the end of the multi frame equals the last octet in the previous frame as shown in the diagram, then in this case, the transmitter will replace and encode the current last octet as a control character F which is also K28.7. Similarly, when the last octet in the current frame, which is also the end of a multi frame equals the last octet in the previous frame as shown in the diagram, then the transmitter shall replace and encode the current last octet as a control character A. However, if an alignment character was already transmitted in the previous frame, the original octet will get encoded. At the receiver side, the corresponding F or A characters are replaced by the value of the octet data decoded at the same position in the previous frame. Now, when the scrambling is enabled, the character replacement is done as follows. When the last scrambled octet in a frame but not at the end of a multi frame equals FC, the transmitter shall encode it as a control character F. Also, when the last scrambled octet in a multi frame equals 7C, the transmitter shall encode it as a control character A. So, this was all about the character replacement logic. So, moving on to the next slide. After link establishment, channel switches to alignment monitoring and alignment correction mode. If at any particular time a lane or frame misalignment has been detected, at the receiver, the dynamic realignment is performed or in some cases where particular errors cannot be corrected, reinitialization request is raised by the receiver. 
Now let us see how, uh, how the dynamic realignment is performed. In this case, F characters are detected in the receiver at unexpected positions. The expected position was assumed end of a frame. So this is a case of frame misalignment. Hence a frame realignment is performed where the boundaries of the frame are changed as per the received F characters as shown in the figure. There is another case where A characters are detected at the unexpected positions. The expected position was the assumed end of a multi-frame. So this is a case of lane misalignment. Hence a lane realignment is performed where the boundaries of the multi-frame are changed to the received A characters as shown in the figure. So moving on to the next slide. So the next feature of 8-bit NB link layer that we are going to discuss is the DL test mode where predetermined test characters are transmitted on all the lanes of a link. Also, here is a list of various types of test sequences that are supported by the transmitter. So coming to the last topic uh, that we are going to discuss, which is clocking and deterministic latency. As we know, the only clock that is transmitted to both logic and converter device is the device clock and every other clock is derived from the device clock. Here you can see the clocks that are being used in JSG 204C. So moving on to the next slide here, we are going to discuss all about the deterministic latency. But before that, let us understand the purpose of an elastic buffer which is present inside the receiver. In case the JSG link is having more than one lane, there may be an intra lane skew due to which the data on each lane is sampled by the receiver at different times. To avoid this, elastic buffers which are present inside each receiver will store the data and release it at a specific buffer release opportunity, which is particularly an LMFC or an LEMC edge. Now, the deterministic latency is the delay from parallel frame-based data input in the transmitter side to the parallel frame-based data output on the receiver side, which is also the release opportunity of elastic buffers. In order to achieve deterministic latency with minimum uncertainty, it is necessary to align the LMFC or LEMCs at both the sides as closely as possible. So moving on to the next slide, here are some of the differences between all the three subclasses of JSC 204 c based on the clocking and the support for deterministic latency. The first difference relates the device clock period to the LMFC or LEMC period. LMFC refers to the local multi-frame clock, whereas the LEMC refers to the local extended multi-frame multi-block clock that is derived using the device clock. In subclass 0, there is no fixed relationship between these clocks. That is, it can be specified by the device man, uh, implementer. For subclass 1, the LMFC or LEMC period shall be whole multiple of device clock period. For subclass 2, there is one more constraint. The transmitter device clock period shall be a whole multiple of receiver device clock period or vice versa. The last and the most important difference is the support for deterministic latency. Subclass 0 devices does not have any support for deterministic latency. Whereas subclass 1 achieves the deterministic latency with the help of sysref signal and subclass 2 with the help of a sync signal. So moving on to the next slide, we will now discuss how the sysref is used for clock realignment in subclass 1 devices. As shown in the diagram, the sysref is sampled at a device clock edge. From this particular edge, there is a fixed delay to the LMFC or LEMC rising edge 
in both the transmitter and the receiver sides. So this is how the clocks are realigned in both the transmitter and receiver devices. So moving on to the next slide. Now the multi ref signal is an optional feature for subclass one devices, which is used to align the LMFCs or LEMCs across the converter devices. This signal is used in place of CISREF signal. That means it is only used where deterministic latency is not required. So this was all about the JEC 204C specification. Thanks to all of you. Now let's move on to the question answer round. If you have any queries, please send in the chat box. So the first question is by Tanik. Uh, the question is how much effort we need if we already have JEZ 204B IP. Can we make an existing JEZ 204B ADC IP compatible with JEZ 204C RX 8B 10B link layer? Yes, you can. Some small changes would be required to make it compatible to the 8B 10B link layer of JEZ 204C. Like you will need to make the deterministic latency in terms of RBD characters in place of frame clock. However, it will not be of much effort. The next question is by Sanjay. The question is what are the pinouts of JEZ 204C? The basic pinouts for a single device is GPDN for serial link and the device clock. Other pinouts can be possible based on the usage or IP requirement. The next question is how many lanes can be possible in a single device? It depends on the device configuration parameter L, which is L number of lanes per converter device and maximum, uh, maximum possible value of L is 32. The next question is where these dummy samples should be generated. The dummy samples are generated in the application layer. The next question is by Soham. The question is what is the relation between the lane and the link? A lane is a serial data interface to drive the data bit by bit serially from transmitter to the receiver. While all the lanes in a device together is called a link. The next question is, is number of converters and the number of lanes always need to be equal? No, they can or cannot be equal. M that is the number of converters can vary from 1 to 256 while the L which is the number of lanes can vary from 1 to 32. Uh, so I hope uh, you found this session useful. So thank you. Have a nice day.